Uh, hi, everyone. And um, Shannon, you didn't tell me I was following up a, a BIM protagonist um, story um, where our business model is based on BIM. Um, nevertheless, I'll, I'll do my best to talk about the transformation of, of our business. And so, uh, Steve Fox is my name. Um, I'm a, uh, the manager of BIM Consulting, uh, but more recently I've become uh, the digital technology lead and principal partner at um, Architectus. And uh, I think that sort of goes to show that Architectus as an organisation is committed to digital transformation and, and digitising their, their, their workplace. Um, this is my digital twin. I brought him out on a few occasions. Um, as you can tell, a spitting image of me. Um, and uh, Mike O'Brien, um, I've just, I just want to, I've changed this slide slightly to include uh, the, his uni class ID. I believe that's Fauna, just for reference. Um, Architectus um, work across several sectors, including uh, BIM Consulting down the, down the bottom here, which operates as a, a separate revenue stream, which is a really interesting way to uh, um, provide a sort of a technical solution to, to their clients. And so um, at, at BIM Consulting, um, we have 30 technology specialists um, with a range of backgrounds and you know, um, anything from in, in architecture, engineering, construction, project management. They're not architects, so to speak. They've got, we've got web developers, uh, we have uh, integration people, um, computational designers. It's a changing sort of workforce in support of the parent company. And we think that gives us a really good critical mass to um, deliver solutions, um, not only to our people in our workplace, but also to our clients and, and to the projects. In a, in, a, in a sincere way, we really want to sort of transform and make, make uh, um, the industry better. Um, Rod showed you before um, the slides um, around uh, where we operate. Um, and part of this story is really about the growth that we're experienced. Back in, I joined in 2014. It's a fledgling company. It's, uh, you know, 130 employees um, and had gone through some really tough times and they just came through unscathed um, in recent years before that. Um, today we're 450, experienced 250% increase in staff numbers over a really short time. I think about when, like my time back then in a small office. It was funny, we actually um, were the floor above Atlassian. I used to catch the, um, the lift up with the Atlassian guys and there was like, you know, looked in through the window, they were sitting on bean bags with laptops. There were about 15 or 20 employees. They are now at 3,000 employees. They kicked us out of that building within a year. So uh, talk about um, transformation um, of that company. In terms of tech, you know, in the technical arena where I operate, um, we've got about 273 technicians. That's sort of BIM people. We've got, we service um, urban design there, um, predominantly a, re, um, a rhino based um, organization and SketchUp, if you, if you like. Uh, running around 123 projects at the moment uh, with 491 Revit files, bit of useless information. There's a, we're fairly busy. So uh, navigating the digital transformation highway, um, I was really enthused that I got a chance to, to speak here and I uh, thought I'd uh, tell, tell my wife Tina about the, the title, Navigating the Digital Transformation Highway, and she said that um, that's a crap title, you don't really navigate a highway, you just sort of drive in a straight line. Anyway, so she, nevertheless I, um, I didn't uh, go showing the rest of the slides for fear of it being rubbished completely. Um, but for us I want to sort of, um, give you a bit of insight into the digital transformation that we've sort of taken as a business um, in answer and in response to that rapid growth that we've experienced, but also in response to um, Industry 4.0 that um, Warwick and, and Alain and others have, have really talked about that connected, uh, the world of connected systems, connected um, systems that um, communicate with one another, that communicate with humans, with people, um, and uh, yeah, we, and and so I suppose to put some context around that, and you know, we've seen a few slides on this already, um, uh, industries that are being disrupted, um, not uh, chicken barn. I think um, country fried chicken's never been so strong. Um, but uh, HMV replaced with you know, Netflix and, and, and sort of live streaming TV. Beast mode on Spotify, you know, um, a playlist that, as you can tell, I follow strictly. And no longer are we you know, working on our dance moves to take it out on a Saturday night on the pool. No, now we just get a hot photo of ourselves, whack it up on a dating app and uh, let, let AI do the rest. We're not taking cabs anymore, using Uber. Has anyone um, worked in London or from London? Yep. Anyone that's uh, been there knows you've never been too far from one of those. It's of course been disrupted with mapping technology. 
And the reason I've just selected a random selection of these is not only are they disruptors, but um, I guess they, they sort of have a sense of uh, m machine learning built into them. I'm not a machine learning AI expert, but from what I understand, it uses big data. It uses um, all, the, all the, that information that's coming through the system. And as far as I know, if it's offering solutions like different ways to get to a destination, then that's potentially um, artificial intelligence. It's offering, a, offering an alternative, a solution that you hadn't necessarily could come to that conclusion on your own. So bring it a bit closer to home and the history of, of, of um, engineering and architecture and drafting, um, going from uh, um, drawing boards up to digitized tablets, uh, tablet digitizers. Uh, this is when I sort of came on board as a fledgling architect um, back in the 90s. I love that looking at this picture. There's a couple of really funny things to note. Um, the Microsoft um, Windows manuals, the, the uh, out tray and the in tray, when the, they used to come and collect your mail. The roller mouse, probably, I dare say. Anyway, good times. Um, and more recently, BIM's become mainstream, as we know. Um, and taken a couple of years ago, you know, computational design, um, using coding to, um, and data-driven design um, as, as, as become pretty much standard practice for, I would say, probably you know, the, the top-tier architecture firms. And we're certainly seeing an appetite for that coming through the universities. And so we, we, we have an obligation to support all of that. Um, looking at the construction industry, I know um, Warwick was talking very much about automated vehicles in the mining industry. You know, why not the, um, the construction industry? And uh, I think we had Andrew Harris last year here talking about the way that Lang, Lang O'Rourke are utilising, um, you know, um, heat mapping of roller passes over, you know, um, infrastructure sites. Um, you know, these are potentially crazy ideas, um, but nevertheless, you know, who knows? I wish I had this when I was um, making a living doing brick paving, although I'm not so sure I would have had a job, but or maybe it was just a different job, right? Um, and from the sublime to the ridiculous, um, are we going to see this sort of tech deployed on construction sites? I hope so, because I bloody love transformers. Um, the modern day business is evolving. Um, it's becoming more connected, potentially increasing in size and number. Um, we're working globally on projects, um, if not now within our own organisations in different regions, but with um, joint venture partners. And Rod um, suggested to you before we, at last count, we had something like 45 international and local collaborations. The workforce is changing. You know, now um, some studies saying suggesting that 50% of people work remotely, which leads to a lot of B, what's it called, BYOD, bring your own device. Um, you know, I'll, I won't go through the stats, but nevertheless, there's a huge uptake on that, and businesses are supporting it and even expecting it in some ways, which is really interesting. And a sad stat, really, um, that um, we're always on. We're always, 73% of us are hitting up emails and, um, you know, out in our own time, including probably about 73% of you right now. Well done. Um, this is a really interesting uh, gra graphic that I sort of in discovered recently. Um, that, uh, this is not to be misinterpreted about the movement away from email and phone towards sort of more social-based um, communications platforms. These things are just, this is a graph about communication preferences. This is just about the fact that traditional consumers prefer that sort of style of um, um, communication as opposed to new consumers which are more in the social spectrum. So businesses now are having to cater for both those preferences. It's not one or the other, right? And just a funny little anecdote, came, this came across my desk the other day while I was just tapping away on Microsoft Teams. Um, you know, I'm having trouble opening Revit like we all do, right? Um, and then just this sort of like funny gyrating one of monkeys and stuff like that and likes galore. This is the modern day worker. This is how they like to operate. They have fun with work. Um, and we have to sort of cater for that, right? Um, and it replaces like 10 emails. Our IT people are loving it, you know? Like all of a sudden our mail systems um, decluttered. It's really fascinating, the workplace of the modern day. So at Architects, we embrace the digital world and the opportunities an innovative mindset presents. Supposedly a, a tagline we came up with. What does it really mean? Uh, well, for us, it's about efficiencies, about optimising, about automating where we can, um, both in the workplace, with our people, on our projects and for our clients. So I want to take you th um, through, I suppose, something that we've sort of established, I guess, if we have to sort of label things up. Um, I, I feel like the culture at Architects is a bit more 
it connected in without having to sort of label um, people within a business, that it is actually genuinely ripples through the, through the business. But if I could say we've got a, a systems architecture hub, an innovation and futures hub, and of course BIM Consulting as a, as a sort of a, a unit, unit entity in its own right. Um, the people that I manage um, are across these geographies and uh, across those sort of um, support functions, I suppose. Um, both in Melbourne, we're building a, a team, and Sydney predominantly, and hopefully more in Adelaide and Brisbane and, and even Perth. Um, Funnily enough, Perth um, has, just, uh, has just landed a couple of WeWork projects. It's really fascinating looking and talking to the WeWork people about how they want to deliver. It's really rapid. It's like quick procurement and fast design, and you know, they're talking to us about how quickly we can coordinate, you know, live coordination. And um, it, it's interesting because in some ways they're um, trapped with like the current modes of procurement, you know, if they had it their way, things would be probably quite a bit different, but they are, they are, unfortunately they're in that position and um, we, we love working with them because it, it just looks so insightful how, how, they, how they aim to deliver. Um, so this is the sort of the, that, um, that systems architecture. Um, my area of influence, I suppose, is really around the sort of uh, production aspect or element of the business around standards. The, um, the, the, this team is, of people are looking around the, the creation and the management of, of standards and also the deployment and uh, implementation and support of those, of those systems and those, that production sort of base material we generate. And if you break it down into sort of a granular level, and apologies if this is a bit like architecturally based, but um, I, I suppose it does relate to a lot of you around like having to create a, a platform for which you can operate. You know, you've, um, if, I won't go into all of this, but if you sort of look at it, you can tell there's a lot of work there. There's a lot that you have to put in place and a lot you need to manage to support, support an organization, it's particularly at that size. Um, I think um, we'll have a responsibility, or I suppose you'd be crazy not to in some ways, to really foster a culture of, um, sort of curiosity and exploration. You know, we, we think that's really important. We put a lot of emphasis on that. Um, because our staff engage with it more, they're happier, and ultimately it delivers better products and better outcomes. And so we do that at, at a sector, individual sector level and at an information technology level. And in a digital technology level where I'm sort of a bit more involved, we've got sort of streams and, you know, if I have to sort of again categorize things, we've got people that look at computation and integrations, apps, research and visualization and comms. And BIM Consulting, as a, as a separate entity, which is the business that I sort of came into um, initially, um, was quite disconnected at, at Arctix at one point, but it's a bit more integrated now. Um, you know, these people, are, I suggest, come from different backgrounds, and it gives us the ability to step outside the architecture arena and start to look at technologies and other um, sort of commissions that we can offer outside. I'll give you an example, I mean, the bread and butter stuff is um, 3D coordination, I um, hesitate to call it clash detection, that um, as Paddy was mentioning, project management in the virtual world, that's how, where we like to see, see ourselves. Um, but uh, we, we, we want an RFP to um, uh, digitalize or geolocate um, 30,000 um, CAD plans that were uh, owned by the University of Sydney. And more than that, to provide the data for the, the centroids, which is the centers of every single room um, in an XYZ location, for you know, th 20 times that. Um, so you know, thousands and thousands of bits of information. They, were, they had students tapping away and realized it was gonna take them a year to do. We turned that around in two weeks, just through getting their data and um, flipping it around and run, writing some scripts. This is the sort of the different opportunities when you start to um, break the mold of, of your traditional business. Um, ideas. And Rod showed you BCAP before, which is an interesting one. The way that we deploy our services um, it depends. Um, you know, look, we, we might, might tailor some support and, um, and improvement initiatives to at a sort of a studio level, as you can see down the middle here, um, which are specific needs and, and wants, or perhaps a, at a sector level, which, you know, every sector has really unique ideas around innovation, how they can um, I innovate, and even at a project level. Um, and all this innovation is, is great. Um, it really needs, though, the, a collaboration piece. Um, it needs, we need to search for a problem. In our own right, we could probably come up with some ideas and some, you know, hear some people talking here and say, we heard this great idea and we think we can do this for you. We really want to tailor that collaboration with individuals in the business. 
Um, we can put some ideas in front of them, we can talk it through and ultimately um, come up with an idea. But if, with, with this comes a lot of investment, right? You can come up with a great initiative idea and, and throw a lot of time and resource, but it has to be paid for. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, you have to sell it. You have to sell it to the decision makers in the business. And I think that's something that um, I've become a lot better at doing. And I think there's a lot of BIM managers who are very technical in nature and manage Revit models really well and they um, you know, can get the best software and get a great deal. But you know what, the, the managing up to your decision makers is the best, you know, so crucial to the transformation process. So I sort of borrowed the next couple of slides from a sort of leadership course that was offered to me. And um, it, it talks about area of influence. You know, you're not going to go and change the world um, just by, uh, with, with your actions alone. No, it's not, it, you, it'll be, a uh, it'll be a, an exercise in frustration. You know, you just won't get the ground you want. So focus on your immediate influence. So at a personal level, change your behaviours, adapt to different technologies. At a team level, if you've got that sort of influence, then, you know, work with them to create better, more um, innovative ways of working. Or at a department level, or even, if you're lucky, at a, at a sort of company level. It seems obvious, right? But it's, it's, it's um, fairly straight, straightforward. And you, ha you really have to form a persuasive message you need to be coming in with simple, positive statements, um, and it needs it needs to have some impact that, that's going to deliver something for the for the organisation. You know, does it make money, save time, make, uh, and money? Does it look good? You know, and back it up with with evidence and and um, and a business case. Everything. This is the this is the language of management. They need facts and statistics and good messaging. Um, I know there's a lot of people that sort of look at digital transformation, say, and, and come up with a, um, I suppose, a bit of shock value and a bit of a, um, a mentality around adapt and die. I tried adapt and die. Your business is going to be backwards in next year if we don't get this software. It will work with some people, but by and large, people will just get sick of that messaging. That negative messaging it, um, can be quite damaging uh, um, for p people. So I always say, you guys are doing, we're doing a great job over here, but guess what? Like, it's, we've got so much potential if we just um, drove it in this sort of direction. That's the sort of messaging that um, managers like to hear. And you can be fantastic at coming up with initiative and you know, you're in implementation mode, it all gets signed off. Um, and you can even implement this, the thing in the system, but guess what? If you don't communicate it, it is going nowhere. We've seen so many um, implementations fall flat in the face because it just doesn't get communicated through. It's, you've got to take it from all angles. You've got to um, top down, um, bottom up. You've got to bring it in sideways. Communication is so important um, and, and continued um, uh, um, improvement around that. I want to sort of go back a little bit to the point I was making about sort of growth in our, in our practice and, and what a sort of an observation that I've sort of seen. Um, these are our systems, our platforms around the business. It's, it's a total minefield. And it changes all the time. And it's a result of the, uh, the squeaky wheel getting the grease. If you can think about, we had 130 people and went to 450. We had really senior people coming in from other, other practices, bringing in their preferred ways of working. We had people in corporate services. We didn't even have an HR de um, department back when I started. So we, we, they brought in their systems. Everyone's bringing in systems. The systems themselves are great. But it's a, it's a bit of a minefield. They don't, and we, what we find ourselves is very disconnected. Things aren't talking to one another. And we're putting Band-Aid IT solutions on things. Um, and what was really plainly clear is our on-premise sort of um, infrastructure was, was a total nightmare. Um, I suspect that there's a lot of people in this room that are getting that point around disconnectivity and um, systems sort of like overload. And um, what was interesting was we're getting hacked a lot and we're getting, you know, we we're vulnerable as well because we're just sort of entering into all of this stuff and just bringing it all on board. And I don't like to get in the way of, 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 of people making good decisions. If someone wants to bring in a bit of an app, then, then we, we'll support it. Um, but we'd need to become a bit, bit smarter about how we do that. Um, I had a conversation with someone that said, imagine um, all, that, all our um, data, imagine a structural engineer puts a, some data up on BIM 360. And we all have unquestioning faith in that single point of truth model that Rob's talk, that Rod's talking about before, and we're, we're procuring it all, and we're um, ordering it all, and we're building off it on the model. And imagine if at some point 
unbeknownst to anyone, a cyber terrorist goes in there, God forbid, so it happens, and goes downgrading the spec of some rebar, goes deleting rebar. Imagine that, that in, you know, the building gets built in five years' time, there's major structural collapses across infrastructure everywhere. That would be absolutely catastrophic. And that's, I don't know, when someone told me that, that, that really sort of started ringing alarm bells. So cybersecurity is important. We got held a $100,000 ransom we had to pay. Um, they were going to shut our systems down. We had no, no choice but to pay $100,000. Um, so anyway, we entered into a, um, <clears throat> we entered into a, uh, a gap analysis with our IT provider. I'm not going to go through any of that, but we've, 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 we, we, we needed to respond and react to this stuff. And they come up with a whole bunch of, um, like they're called stage one initiatives and a roadmap, an IT roadmap, which is really interesting. It's not really my language, but it's, uh, it's all good. What we sort of discovered was that um, we've got a lot of platforms that are sitting on different web services, Microsoft, Azure, Amazon, um, SAP. And, and then on the right, we, we, the recommendation was to go off, take everything off-prem and put it into an infrastructure as a solution um, provider. And so they host all our file, file servers and other sort of data that we use from our systems. So we truly sort of became, over the course of the last year, a, a full cloud computing organization with um, SAS software as a service, um, you know, all, all those apps that get deployed um, to you uh, over the web, but also built in with some resilience with um, infrastructure as a service, you know, um, someone holding all of our data. Not cheap. Um, and this is sort of what it looks like, not the prettiest looking map, but what it sort of um, shows is that uh, We've built in redundancy, so we've got you know um, backup um, supplies. So if our um, primary um, cable goes down, we've got a secondary physical cable to support that like loading up that we've, we're finding on the internet. Um, we've got the ability now to sort of dedicate resources into Autodesk or to, into Microsoft or whatever. Um, that's pretty much it. We put lots of layers of security, and we've now got three layers of security um, that that um, we're trying to get through. I suppose one of the biggest um, positive outputs of all of this was the one big gigabit per second connection we um, deployed in each of the offices. What it meant was that we could now go hardcore on BIM 360. So we put every project up there in the cloud now. Um, but I guess um, despite all these great applications, we're getting a lot of feedback from our, our people saying, um, love the systems, but I don't need any more technology. That's good. That's a good thing. But um, my personal efficiency is actually being um, impacted here. I'm actually not as efficient as I used to be because I have to go and log in to seven different things in the course of my day to get what I need and to and to get that that, that information that you need off me. So it's really it's, uh, does it, I get, I'm, I, there's probably a few people nodding their head going yes systems fatigue got it yep. Um, so our stage two improvement initiatives are really around um, addressing some of this, making it a better, a better digital user experience in our business. Um, IT transformation based on discovery and evidence rather than just um, giving it to the, the squeaky wheel. Further, de further deduplication, so we've got a lot of duplication, we'd want to improve that. We pay enormous amounts of money for, um, for uh, our 50 terabytes of information sitting on someone else's cloud. Connection of our project data, connection of our, and integration of our systems, and de better deployment of software and license management, et cetera. Right, um, now I'm gonna bombard you with a whole lot of randomly um, put stuff that I sort of find sort of fairly interesting with what we've created over the last year or so. And I think back to four or five years ago, and I would never have imagined that we've got to where we are, like, in doing some of the things we've been doing. It's a, it's a sort of testament to the rate of change that we experience as an industry and as a group. Um, Rod showed you before our documentation standards, our modeling guidelines. So here it is um, put up into SharePoint, into our digital technology wikis. Um, there's so much resource in there, it's pretty, pretty remarkable. A lot of it links back to sort of Autodesk Re Revit wikis because it's very sort of Revit-centric. But here we, we can put animated GIFs and like little like instructionals on there. And here's a good example of just how we can, um, how we set up works. That's a, it's just a random example. Um, we deploy fortnightly tech sessions um, about transformation in the industry, we do the best we can. Um, whilst our people are very tech savvy, they're not necessarily like understand transformation, like they're just sort of following their mentors and still just, um, I don't know, into design and taking 
things for granted. They're not necessarily taught of this at university and they're not really seeking it out. So we want to provide the culture and give them some great examples of what can be done. And we, if any tech partners in the room or any in engineers or people are doing in, in anything interesting, please reach out. We'd love for you to talk to our people. They're just like little 20-minute sessions. Uh, we deploy like little 15-minute bytes of you know, tools on Revit. And look, we've got people that in design, and we've got delivery specialists, and then we have people that um, just um, across different sectors, we do things so differently from job to job, sector to sector. It's really hard to train people. Um, but anyway, we, we, we deliver it anyway. We've got a, um, a IT and digital technology help desk. And the way that works is you go and log in on our intranet and basically emails a, a Microsoft Teams site. And um, yeah, basically we can just share it out. So, you know, these guys are having a conversation, do we, oh, who wants to do the door scheduling? Oh my God, really? Okay, I'll take it. Um, so uh, this is a great way just to make sure the best people get onto the right support. Um, Look, th th I presented this at Melbim, uh, or Sitara, my colleague did, um, around depositing our 400 odd Revit files into a bucket and then running Dynamo on it, spitting out some um, dashboards to project leaders at their project reviews so that they could see that the health of the model was okay or needed work. Um, then it was all sort of managed up on, um, you know, and this is sort of what it all looked like. It's changed now, um, it's, and, and they sort of integrated some Python coding because Dynamo was a bit clunky. Um, and it was really good. I think this is a video, let it play. It sort of shows trends of how the model's been going. Um, you know, we just, man we just monitor it and sort of see how things are going. Um, look, you could, and it talks about some of the things that um, Alain was um, showing about uh, with um, um, managing online in a live environment. So now with um, mission control in place, um, we now no longer have to grab the Revit models. Uh, we've got the ability to go into the API of um, user, user um, machines and just grab all that data out without having to run any of that. And this is sort of what it all looks like. Don't ask me how. Um, but because we can get into the API of our software now, if it's open protocol, we can manage use, utilization. So here's our licenses being pretty well utilized most part of the day. You can see the five fingers represent five days of the week and the weekends are in there. Um, we can look at individual workstations and start to deploy software, see what, what, or what hasn't got there. So we, we will turn our IT support around from a reactive, you know, I've got some massive problems, and then try to create solutions around that to actually we're seeing trends of, of things here that we, we want to get in front of this before, before it happens. That's, I mean, we can't say we're doing it quite yet, and a lot of this is, um, you know, still works in progress, but how good would that be if you get like a war a alarm every time a, a, a grid gets deleted or a, or a Heaven forbid, a level gets deleted with all the elements that are hosted to it. Um, I don't know really how we deal with that, but um, it might be just a warning. Do you really, really, really want to delete that level? And uh, this was a really cool thing we I came up, uh, I came across um, last year, upcodes. Uh, does anyone use it or know about it? It um, basically looks at local building regulations and compliance and um, builds my eye around that. So it's sort of like, a, I call it, we call it, I think we call it a spell check, spell check for Revit, which is really interesting. Love to um, know more a bit about bit more about that. <coughs> so this is how we used to operate in um, Newforma. We still still utilise Newforma. Um, we've got a lot of AMS procedures, architectural management systems, your QA, we're ISO nine double one compliant, all that sort of stuff. We th we, we must thought it was this was awesome. You know, hyperlinking to different things. It was awesome. We could go and check out the shall we submit and do a you know what what's the chance of us winning this job and. It's all hyperlinked on Excel, and we can hit save. How, how good's that? And when the auditors come, they'll, um, they'll give us a good score. Um, we've now built our own, um, well, we've, act, well, we've worked with, I should say, a, um, a, a Microsoft um, developer to build on, on our intranet, uh, I guess, a, um, uh, a fully blown um, quality management system. So it steps you through the gateways of a project, and we're now digitizing all of those um, Word forms, all those Excel files into um, digitized forms, so it lives up in a data warehouse somewhere. Um, that Rod mentioned BCAP before. This had humble beginnings. It was just designed because our BIM consulting team couldn't deliver good reports out of Navisworks. It was a total farce. It was just if anyone that tries to re report on Navisworks know what I'm talking about. So we just built a really basic web interface that meant that we could get a decent looking PDF of all the images and the comments. So we're just harvesting the data out of Navisworks and reporting it up. And it's turned into a full, full blown issue management system. Maybe we skip the down a bit. Oh, we could rock it out. 
Thanks. Um, yeah. So um, <laughs> this is another example of how we're transforming, not only with the app, but actually now we've got staff that can do cool animations and videos um, for us, which is another way of like communications is sort of being um, um, disrupted. But look, this started off um, with humble beginnings. It's not BIM connected. It doesn't claim to be like BIM software, but it's just really simple to use. And uh, look, we deployed on all our BIM consulting sort of um, BIM management work. Um, it's no different to lots of other sorts of um, applications. Um, and we're actually now deploying it across architectures because we think that takes risk out of um, a lot of the work that they do. And so we get a bit of data around, you know, how many items we've got out, sitting out there um, as a sort of managing the whole platform. Um, this, I mean, the, the whole project reporting is um, an easy one. And um, Paddy, I, I heard him say building websites is easy. I'm like, what? Building websites easy? You're kidding me, aren't you? I think I think if you're templating it, it's fine. But we built a first generation beacon. We had to completely rebuild it. Like here's all the tech stack behind it all. Um, it's uh, for the for the uninitiated, it looks crazy. But I think the people that know it like will go, yeah, yeah, that looks about right. Um, it needs. I, I hear that web apps fail quite often because. Um, they're, having, they're not managed well as for a project management level. We see the tech team could be working, but it really needs some objectives of where you want to get the, the application. And anyone that sort of knows about um, developing apps would sort of get that, I suppose. But yeah, look, it, it, there's, there's lots of products that are doing similar things. And, and that was my big question. Like, why are we building this thing when there's so many other applications sitting out there doing exactly the same thing? And you know, are we going to have to go and continually support this and, and pay high money for a, um, for a full stack developer or a team of developers if this goes out any further than it currently is. Um, it's more re closely related to the more simplified, you know, um, um, issue task management sort of apps that you find out there in the industry. Um, going back to BIM 360 for a bit, I mean, we've obviously taken that up a lot. And what it enabled us to do was to um, give us deeper collaboration with, um, with partners. And um, it, it really um, sort of led us to entertain the idea of offshoring. We, we haven't really done that much offshoring compared to other architecture firms. Um, but as you see with, um, with Rob, we're starting to do that more after that positive experience that he had. Um, um, is Ashish uh, Mahapatra here? Ashish, stand up. You're out there, aren't you? So we, we, we utilize um, uh, Weaverbird um, technologies um, at, um, to do our existing conditions modeling. So when we get point data, um, we're not really that inclined to go and model it ourselves. And um, so go and have a chat with Ashish. He's got a huge team that can um, smash out point cloud existing modeling. And um, we're also utilizing Weaver Bird technologies potentially for, to go through our contact list. We've got thousands of contacts in the business who, who probably half of the information is incorrect. And so we're looking at, that's something that we think um, someone like uh, Shish and his team can go through and like go back through LinkedIn and update all of those um, contact lists and manage that database better. Really, that, we think that's you know the real future for, for offshoring is the things that you just can't op, um, can't comp, you know, um, drive with computation and automation. You just have to hit it with manual manual um, labor. So I mentioned Microsoft Teams. We're an Office 365 organization, um, and so this is a way that we are starting to deploy. Um, look, I'm not suggesting this is going to be the final answer to our problems, but it's it's a bit of a stopgap whilst we've got just so many systems going. So all we're really doing here, if anyone if you know Teams, is these are all your teams here. You can run the conversations through. And I'm just opening up, a, a, I guess, like an iframe on a website or whatever. You're just opening up access to all of these project-related databases that you sort of go with in a, on a day-to-day -day basis. So you know, um, if it's web-based, you can just add it to the, to the tab. Um, it's not necessarily integrating and connecting. It's just providing a single entry point to all of that sort of information. Really easy, um, off the shelf, and um, low-hanging fruit sort of um, solution. And it's had huge uptake. It's not been mandated, but every time someone sees it, it goes, can you set that up for me? Can you set that up for me? Ideally, we get to a point where a person comes into the business, their profile, their projects just flows through everything. We've got it flowing through a few things right now, but we want it flowing through all of our systems. So no more logging in. We want like multi-factor authentication. We just want a good user experience, which just gets access to everything. Uh, yeah, I said random. Um, it is ra uh, randomly jumping onto VR and AR technologies. Um, we do have um, one of our team really into um, in the uh, interactivity opportunities with Unreal Engine in gaming. And so, um, and I just saw Jeremy over here. <laughs> He's probably the most elite person in Australia to talk about this sort of stuff. Um, 
but uh, look, we, we really love the way that um, Unreal Engine offers a, um, some really incredible, um, uh, sorry, I'll just go back one slide, see if I can get that to work. Anyway, this is, um, you know, designing the entire 360 landscape and um, serving it up at, in a web-based environment. You know, 360s are easy to serve up on the internet, and, and that's where the real future is, right? Uh, I mean, obviously, um, as David Bowie know, well, well knew. Um, and so we serve that up to our clients, or potentially, and I think, Jeremy, you might mistake, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, this thing called uh, Unreal um, Pixel Stream, which now enables you to serve up this sort of technology on the cloud. So you don't need to run, a, run an application on your desktop anymore. You can get access to this sort of level of quality live and potentially interactive, right? So this is really, really cool stuff. Uh, and we're getting better at visual communications, no more just like single diagrams, you know. To communicate ideas, we think you should be looking, we should sort of move into more animated sort of and, um, um, yeah, animated um, anim uh, graphics overlaid with information um, panels. Now, the next step for us is, and we've got a proposal out to a university at the moment, and fingers crossed we get it, is that it's about a master plan um, that relates to um, an interactivity. So it's, they don't want the 600-page A3 brochure that sits on the shelf. They want an interactive web-based master plan where they can just go, go and engage with it and get all of that information they need. And that's, um, for us, a, a really good opportunity to bring in the services that, architect, that BIM Consulting and our team can deploy back to the architecture, architecture business. It's sort of in that, sort of swimming in that blue ocean, right, that um, we heard about uh, before. But this question constantly comes up, when do you, when do you develop and when do you um, j uh, just buy it off the shelf? You know, we could go and build an AR app if we wanted to um, with a whole bunch of coding, but then you, you just don't have to look far to find this, these products sort of already available. So it's a big question. Um, we're doing a lot of work with digital fabrication. This is with Lippmann Builders and Strong Build, although they're, they're out now. This was always intended just to be a temporary, a temporary building, um, but check it out now. It's a, um, it's a beautiful thing that they want to keep. And this is another building at Macquarie University in Sydney. This is a, a, um, a faculty of medicine. And um, this is, uh, I, I, hate, I don't, I, I won't use the L word um, um, that ends with D. Um, it's got an O in the middle. Um, but we're basically modeling these components for um, fabrication and cutting out the supply chain or integrating with the supply chain so we can get, you know, models, single um, build from single point of truth models. And here's the thing going together like a glove. Apparently they look through those little holes at the bottom of the CLT beam. They could just see clear daylight. Beautiful. Uh, we do a lot of computational analysis around um, some of the compliance issues we face with solar, solar analysis and like view impacts and stuff like that. Um, I won't bore you with this one, but we had to analyze 60,000 points of reference um, to, to demonstrate that the building on the right, which was our preferred more efficient floor plate, um, was no worse on the sky factor, like the, the um, silhouette of the sky, than this compliance scheme. So much taller, but um, shorter and fatter. Um, what's, there was no negligible difference. Um, doing things with computation and um, generative op design. Um, this was uh, in the early days of Project Fractal. I think it's now called Refinery, if I'm not mistaken, from the Autodesk guys here. Um, we made this curv curvilicious looking roof. Um, Framing up, I suppose, the parameters of, um, of design, and then Arup went and stuck a, 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 a truss on it, and then we could look at optimizing steel weight and stuff like that. Uh, look, I'm conscious that sort of we're, we're running out, so I'll, I'll just flick through this, but we reduced that um, beautiful double curved wall from 800 panel types um, and 800 panel widths to um, potentially three, uh, or yeah, three panel widths. I don't know why the odd number out. Um, but basically, it was all about the joint differences. Um, and so up the top here, you can see that if we um, were, if we allowed a um, 15 millimeter gap between the joints, we could get the panel cuts down to three using computation. If we, if, if we wanted a really beautiful, like really tightly seamed um, sandstone jointing system, we'd, we'd have to do about 20. So we're already optimizing and, and scheduling out all of this information for the builders to come and, and cut it. And we're starting to bring th tools in that traditionally would be done by engineers post-justified analysis. Now we're sort of bringing these into airports, into um, education facilities, schools. We're checking stairwells. You know, imagine the assembly pours out of the main hall and everyone's going gunning down that stairwell. The staircase complies, but guess what? You've got this huge bottleneck of students. So we're, we like, 
we do this like really um, on, a, on a regular basis. And again, it's just, this stuff just sort of grows. We're not mandating it, but it just grows with popularity. And someone sees someone else doing it and going, this is great. We get, I get to cop into those sorts of um, conversations all the time. Uh, 3D coordination, it's sort of what we do. Uh, I just quickly want to touch on um, our approach to this. We don't necessarily think data works. Um, uh, sorry, uh, massive data overload could just um, hamper sort of some of the, um, the decision making on projects for project managers of, of construction companies. We're very, I, I believe in graphic communication. I believe that if we suggest that your scope, I won't even mention LOD, if your scope is clearly um, increasing in, in um, uh, complexity and, um, and completeness, that gives subcontractors, designers, an opportunity to get their progress claim. And project managers look at this and go, Steve, love this stuff because I can see that that's developing at these milestones. And equally, how, it's not just about finishing up your scope. Anyone, anyone can manage, like, throw heaps of stuff at a model, but how well coordinated is it? How, how well is it um, hitting together? So these are, you know, for the mechanical um, um, subcontractor in this system, areas that are his responsibility in red, and you can see they're diminishing over time. And so for us, it's all about graphics, and, and people respond so well to that idea. Why go, why go um, putting, uh, look, if, if at an organizational level, if you're not using blue bangers and um, digital set out, why do you want to go and model all of the stuff in, above an auditorium? It, there's just plenty of space. You've got no issues with all that. So what we say is, we'll ease off on the requirements, guys. If, if the client's not using it, don't worry about it. Take it easy. But spend the, spend the time in the plant rooms and the, and the risers and those really tightly, uh, tightly defined spaces. You know, we have to be smarter about the way we work and deliver, not just sort of blanket um, requirements um, on, on teams. Uh, we do a lot of site digitization. We even uh, bought a scanner. Um, and we sort of um, look at drone, uh, working with drone specialists. This is just a whole bunch of photos and um, using like really basic out of the box software from Autodesk with recap photo just to convert that into, um, into point clouds and, and mesh, and there it is there. Pretty close to, to accurate. And we've also just purchased some uh, software that uses a bit of machine learning and AI. So this is, uh, Urban Design team, team are often uh, modeling sort of that sort of stuff in SketchUp, and it's taking forever. So we purchased a license of this, and it's just reading heights. It even knows like when you've got pitched roofs versus flat roofs, and it knows the heights. It gets the, um, the, the building outlines off um, other mapping systems. And then we can throw other GIS-based information into each of those, like plot num uh, numbers and stuff like that. Anyway, and, we use, and we've subscribed to Near Map, Near Map as well, Near Map 3D, and is an example. Sometimes we want more accuracy, and this is pretty accurate, um, even though it's taken uh, from aircraft. Um, we can pull that data out. It's a bit hard to deal with because it's all one contiguous mesh, but anyway. Uh, and just finishing up, um, the, the, the interesting part about being connected with the architecture firm is that they stumble across weird and wonderful things for their clients all the time. This is a way that they looked at spatial um, uh, relationships and building stock and what was utilized and what wasn't. And basically, we took that idea and said, and because the space management team have got like a huge task of planning universities, why don't we just build you an app based on the Forge platform where you can do all these advanced queries on that. And we actually um, automate the replication of all of the, the rooms themselves. Okay, they're not um, exactly geographically precise or uh, geometrically precise, but for them it's a great insight into what their building stock is. And, um, and we're sort of looking to develop that a bit further. And this is all on the Forge platform. Initially, we took it through Revit, and I was talking to Stefan a bit earlier. We actually build this directly from CAD files in the Forge um, platform, and then potentially bring it back down into Revit if we really wanted to. So this is the this power of the, and the new way of, of working. And um, this is something that they would have done previously, the, um, the uh, in, uh, education people. They would have just modeled up individually heaps of blocks um, based on a brief, and then just assembled them and done spatial planning. But now we just say, give us the Excel file of the brief, and we'll just run it through Dynamo, and you guys can play with those colored blocks until you, <laughs> to your heart's content. Um, look, I'll just race through this. We, we get involved in our own internal research. This was um, an aspirational idea to work with the Academy of uh, Interactive uh, um, Gaming or Computation or something. I can't remember in Adelaide. Anyway, the idea is to build a, uh, s simulate the 3D construction of a potentially 3D printed airport or uh, space station. Um, pretty wild stuff. Um, you may have seen media releases. Um, so um, there's a $28 million bid from uh, Monash University, Len Lease, 
um, University of Melbourne and Donovan Group around the, for the, um, the Cooperative Research Centre. Um, and again, this is what they're hoping to achieve, you know, uh, innovation and save, saving of time and money. And we're and, um, partnering with USW with a lot of other engineering firms and a lot of architecture practices, uh, looking to do something similar with an Australian Research Council um, opportunity. Uh, just to summarise, you know, um, some, some of the points from before. Put a business plan together to get the team right, um, connect the business departments, get the infrastructure right, get the user experience um, right, implement a lot, get some wins on the board and celebrate them and um, dedicate some time and money to research. And uh, that's, that's it for me. Thank you.